raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. The promise is amazing. That this spirit is the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, this spirit has the power to give you life too. That's encouraging. That's the promise. But the other part of it, the it, is a little bit scary. Before we can say what Paul is trying to say here in Romans 8, I have to take you backwards a little bit. You see, Paul assumes something. He assumes that his hearers in Rome already know about the Holy Spirit. The disciples, the apostles have been talking about the Holy Spirit's work in people's lives for decades by this point. And so now Paul is assuming that they already know about this stuff. But for you and me, maybe we need a little bit of a refresher. So for us today, I don't usually do this. I don't usually jump from one book that we're studying into another book. But today, just humor me, let's jump over to Galatians, just for a moment. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. It's just a few pages to the right. You get to Corinthians, and then you're there. First and second Corinthians, and then you're there, Galatians. We're going to jump to chapter 3, beginning of verse 7. I want to show you something here. Oh, not verse 7. Let's we'll start. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, verse, we'll just start at the beginning. You foolish Galatians, he says, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? or by your believing what you heard. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Let me ask you, does this sound like Paul? I think it sounds exactly like Romans. It sounds exactly like the kind of stuff we've been talking about in Romans. He talks about Abraham believing in God and God credits it to him as righteousness. That's chapter 4. We covered that already. He's talking about the flesh or the spirit. He's talking about the law or the flesh. Things like that. But here's the thing. In this passage here in Galatians, he tells us specifically how a person receives the spirit. And it's this. By believing what you've heard. Not by doing some work. Not by accomplishing some skilled task or anything. It's just by believing what you heard. So when we come back to Romans, he says, if you have the Spirit, well, how do you have the Spirit? By believing what you've heard. So if you believed what you've heard, then you have the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, then you have all this power at work in your life. This is my point. Mental transformation. It's one thing to think about the Spirit. It's another thing to be absolutely firmly convinced that He's with you. Mental transformation means accepting and trusting the fact that God has placed His Spirit in you. That He's there. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside you right now. If you have believed what you've heard about Jesus, then you are in Christ and then you are in the Spirit and the Spirit is in you. Go with it. Trust it. The second thing Paul talks about is practical discipline. So it means mental transformation. Secondly, it also means practical discipline. See what he says here in verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. I call this practical discipline. Uh, ancient Christian scholars and teachers and writers and uh, devotional type people would use the phrase mortification of the flesh. I think that's just a, a fancy huge word for killing. Mortification. Mortification means to cause something to die. And the flesh is all the stuff Paul is talking about. He says here, put to death the misdeeds of the body. What are your misdeeds? If we could just spend a few moments thinking about that. What does it mean to put to death a bad habit? What does it mean to put to death a bad attitude? 
What does it mean to put to death the anger? What does it mean to put to death the lust? Or what does it mean to put to death whatever it is that's your misdeed? Now the challenge for us is that it's easy for us to try to come up with a recipe, a set of do's and don'ts, a, a checklist like the Howcast we looked at earlier, a checklist for how to put to death these things. But Paul doesn't say that. He doesn't say by working harder, put to death the misdeeds of the body. He doesn't say by learning more, put to death the misdeeds of the body. He doesn't say by just simply going to church every single time you can, put to death the misdeeds of the body. He doesn't say by avoiding those bad people, put to death the misdeeds of the body. He says, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body. There's somehow where God wants His own Spirit to help you conquer those things. I have a relative, a cousin, well actually, let's see, she's my, she's my aunt-in-law. Anyway, we had a family reunion yesterday, and so my wife's aunt, so she's Aunt Kathy to me, uh, she was telling me the story. We were, I don't know how we got on the topic, really, but we were talking about smoking, and she told me that she used to smoke, and, and she quit, and I said, well, that's awesome. How did you do it? She tells me this story where when she was younger, like uh, she had just recently been married, and just recently become a Christian, and around that same time, her brother, Mike, committed suicide. And so that shook up the family, her younger brother. And so that shook up the family. And she decided, I want to do something to try to bring some good out of this situation. What can I possibly do? And the thought that came to her mind is, well, I could give up smoking. I could give up smoking in honor of my brother's life. I could give up smoking to try to redeem a little bit of this. And then I could say, well, that was one of the reasons why I gave up smoking. So she made that decision. And she says the night she made that decision, she smoked a pack and a half and went to bed. Now, I'm not going to say anything about that. But she went to bed, and then the next morning, she was craving. I mean, she was craving a cigarette like mad. And she just said, I can't do this on my own. And she knelt down, and she prayed, and she said, God, you have got to help me. You've got to help me conquer this. About 4 o'clock in the afternoon, she realized she hadn't had a cigarette. Didn't want one, didn't need one, and didn't desire one from that day forward. Somehow, now God doesn't work that way in everybody's life, but somehow she had reached that place of completely giving it over to God and saying, I'm not going to put another cigarette in my hands unless you put it in my hands, God. Well, of course, he's not doing that, so she didn't. She just moved on. And she gave God all the credit for taking away the desire. Well, a couple years later, though, maybe it was just a couple months, she saw her husband's pack of cigarettes on the kitchen table. And said, oh, I should reward myself. Maybe just one. So she snuck one out, went to the bathroom, opened the windows, smoked next to the window, just that one. And then for like two years after that, one cigarette every day. She just, that same cigarette, just one cigarette a day for two years. She says, then she had a dream. And in that dream, her mom gave her a present. And when she opened the present, there were four ashtrays in it. And she said, mom... What are you doing to me? You know I've quit. And her mom said, Oh, have you? <laughs> and the next morning she woke up and was like, uh, That's done. So here's the deal. All I can say is that here's a woman who says, I need God's Spirit to give me strength. But somehow in the midst of that, she both was willing to listen, even though God spoke to her through this kind of crazy dream, she was willing to listen. And she was also willing to let go and let God really move in her life. I've spent time with other people, and this one guy called me on the phone. He was like, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I want to quit smoking. And I was like, okay, how serious are you? He was like, well, I'm serious. I'm going to do it this time. I said, do you have any cigarettes in your house? He said, yeah. I said, get rid of them. Right now? <laughs> uh, well, what are we doing here? <laughs> what are you calling me for? No, I need you to pray for me. Pray that God would... Take away the desire, okay? I'll pray for God to take away the desire. God, would you send fire to his house so his cigarettes all burn up? <laughs> um, <laughs> see, that's the thing. It's one thing to just expect God to do it for you. It's another thing to say, God, I'm willing to let you do this in me. I don't know where the line is between that, but Paul says, by the Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the body. Now, we've got a lot left in chapter 8, so let's kind of race through this. 
It also means one more thing. It means living as sons and daughters. Take a look at this. Verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Paul says, listen, if the Spirit is in you, then you have been adopted as a son or a daughter. You've been adopted as a son or a daughter. That's what living with the Spirit means. It means taking this completely new perspective that, it's, that I'm a son of God. I've been adopted. I've been brought in. I can speak to God as my dad. My father. Abba is the word there that was used in Aramaic that was the baby's word. The word a baby would use for his dad, Abba. Daddy. So the Spirit brings us into a completely new relationship with God. Now, Paul does this really interesting thing. Immediately after recognizing that we're sons and daughters, he takes us on a long journey through suffering. Because, see, this is the weird thing about you and me. It's okay for us to call God loving when times are good for us. It's easy for us to call God our Father when times are going well for us. It's easy for us to believe the Holy Spirit is working in our lives when times are going well for us. But when we face suffering, then what? Then God isn't a loving dad. Then God is a strict disciplinarian. If times are going bad, then God isn't someone who's got my best interests at heart. God is someone who's got his own agenda. See, that's where we begin to get into a weird place with God. And Paul makes sure that we have a good perspective on this stuff too. So he says three things about suffering underneath the category of us being God's children. Check it out with me. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated.